Hello, my name's Nathan Ward from the Big Story Trust and earlier this week I caught up with a man who fooled Penn and Teller. He's one of the most funniest and busiest comedy magicians in the UK, John Archer. Thank you for taking the time out, John, to speak to me. For people that don't know you, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a comedy magician. Um, I've been doing it full time for 21 years. Uh, and I do about half of what I do is church stuff and the other half pays decent money. <laughs> That's fair enough. And John, from my experience, I've known you for a while now, to be fair. The first time yeah. I saw you was in 98 when you did a theatre show at Durham University and I was a student, um, but then caught up with you later on in the Fellowship of Christian Magicians. Um yes. You, half your work is in churches, and to be fair, you're most probably the leading comedy magician in the UK, if not further afield. Tell me a little bit about what you do and how you do the stuff in churches, because you're not a straightforward gospel magician, but you, you're no. pretty much very dominant in that field. I, I take a similar approach to Andre Cole, because he sort of does his magic show. Uh, as far as I know, I've never seen him, but from what I've heard, he does his magic show as it is, sort of mm. his illusion show. Uh, and then the second half, he talks about his faith. And I think, I think, from what I've heard in the interval, he sort of says, "I'm, you know, the second half is going to be me talking about my faith. Uh, and if you want to leave, you can. I don't actually tell them they can leave because they probably would. So, mm. um, but I take that approach. I don't really do gospel tricks. I don't do tricks with a message. Uh, I have a couple of things that, Sometimes if I get asked to do a church service type thing and they want me to do something family-based with kids in the audience, I have a couple of things I sometimes do, but very rarely. I mean, you know, it, it could go for two or three years before I ever do that sort of thing. Hmm. The vast majority of the time I'm just doing my act as is. Um, there are references to me being a Christian within that act, but not, not heavily. And then... Um, depending on what the church want, uh, will depend on, on whether or not... The second half, I can do my testimony, which is like a 40-minute stand-up mm. comedy testimony routine. Um, and it is stand-up comedy, but my uh, sort of how, how it came to faith is all clearly in there. Mm. And the sort of gospel points are clearly in there. Um, but then some churches don't, don't want anything that heavy, so some churches just want to... Uh, a five-minute thing, in which case I'll do two slots of my act with a little five-minute investigate-further type of talk. So so there's variations in it, but I rarely do the traditional gospel magic thing of, you know, a trick that um, has a message, hmm. really. I think from what I'm hearing from you, John, is you've got two solid elements. You've got a very solid magic act, and then you've got a solid testimony that you've thought out and have worked out yeah. how to present very well, and combining the two in that pure form seems very powerful instead of trying to merge it all together, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But there again, you've got to bear in mind that, you know, a lot of times churches just want, they just want clean, wholesome entertainment from a Christian guy they can trust. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and everything in between, from that right away through to right, we want the gospel presented, you know, because it's an alpha launch or whatever it is. So... I'm always flexible, and I wouldn't say there. If somebody books me, I wouldn't say this is what I provide. I would say these are the options. And normally, um, normally, I, I would say there's three options I provide, which is pure entertainment, uh, no Christian message at all, pure entertainment with a short um, teaser type thing, and then entertainment interval and testimony. And those are the three, the three basic approaches that I will I will I will have and those are the sort of things I offer to a church. And what's interesting, John, for me, is that you're a very busy magician, and I know because I've tried to book you many times. <laughs> um so you're not just one that is on a world tour on Facebook every week, if that makes sense. You actually <laughs> yeah. are. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And doing the work. And you're saying that fifty percent of your work is in the UK church. And what you're also saying yeah. is that Actually, what you do in that church context isn't your traditional tricks for Jesus, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's true. And, um, you know, I don't know. I've always done it that way. So uh, I don't know whether I'd be busier if I did 
did it the other way and did, you know, sort of, you know, gospel tricks as such, or whether I'd be less busy. I think um, the vast majority of churches book me um, because I, uh, I'm i not cringy, you know yeah. what I mean? I, I think you're good. Uh, well, I would hope that that's why they book me. Uh, it's certainly not because I'm cheap, because I'm not cheap. Um, no. I used to be cheap, I'm not now. Um, <laughs> I keep putting my price up to try and stop them booking me. But... Um, <laughs> But it's true, though. I mean, it's fascinating. This is the debate that I wanted to really get in with you, John, to be fair, yeah. into with you, around kind of everything that you do stacks against what people might think the marketplace want, but you're one of the most busy people out there. Yeah, and I, th- I think it is because the vast majority of churches don't want somebody to come in and uh, appeal to the Christians. Which, if you do a gospel trick, Christians can love it and go, oh, isn't that nice? It, you know, the the trick had a message and it explained that nice and easily. But the vast majority of churches, when they do an outreach event, usually are, are reaching out to people who aren't Christians and, and don't have any faith. And so when, when you, you know, when you start mixing um, a message with a trick, hmm. sometimes um, it can seem odd and strange to a non a non Christian you know, an unchurched person watching it. So I think a lot of times, uh, and I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure there's loads of people who don't book me because I'm not what they want, mm. but obviously I never find out about them in the same way that, you know, people who think magic is evil are never going to book me. So I never I never really come across, or very often come across those people, unless there's a, a fringe element within the church who have that feeling and they still book me anyway. Mm. But um, so, so I, I suppose I never find out about all the people who don't book me because I'm not what they want, but certainly all the people who book me, and it is a lot, as you say, I'm busy, I think book me because they want something that um, feels re- modern and relevant and doesn't and doesn't feel um, dated. And, and the, the problem with a lot of gospel magic tricks is they 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 are quite old school. They sort of fall into that category of tricks that were done in the 60s and 70s with silk handkerchiefs and boxes and, you know, and magic wands. And to be honest, modern magic isn't like that anymore. Modern magic has moved on. Most of what I do is I don't have anything that looks like a prop. Mm. Most of what I do is, um, you know, it, it tends to be a lot of it is mentalism. Um, but, I mean, you can do modern magic that isn't mentalism. It just needs to look... Um, you know, up to date, and uh, you know, uh, I think gospel magic can look old. Not not necessarily just because it's gospel magic, but because the type of magic that is used for gospel magic can seem dated. Even the tricks themselves can seem dated. But you know, I mean, the message is dated. It's two thousand years old, so that's, <laughs> that's dated to start with. But um, so, so I mean, that's why I think. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say I'm not a fan of gospel magic because I know you're doing a tape about gospel magic, but um, I think I'm probably not a fan of what most gospel magic is. In the same way that I'm not really a fan of corporate magic. Mm. Um, you know, if you if you go to a corporate event, you know, and you you see somebody at a sales stand doing a trick where they're sort of saying, you know. There's five cards here, and you know there are opportunity and you know saleability and you know uh, uh, and different things, and they're trying they're trying to sell a product to you or sell that particular company to you. I often find that um, ne- neither aspect is served very well. The message or the the trick are compromised. You normally compromise the trick because you have to make it fit the message or you compromise the message a little bit mm. and don't don't give them messages you know what it really deserves because you're trying to make the message fit the trick and there aren't many tricks that you know you know i mean i watched one the other day and i, I don't know whose trick it is and i don't want to insult them but, but you know it was a it was a sort of a, a water to wine trick where you place the cross in the glass of wine and the and the wine becomes clear and it, for me, that slightly trivialises what the cross is all about. Mm. Um, and I know it, in some ways it's it's helping people to understand them. And, and for kids, I can maybe see that they might be able to see a visual thing that helps them grasp. But for me, it's not really um, 
it's not really talking about what the cross is all about. Mm. Uh, and also the trick is, you know, the sort of the, the instant water wine effect. Uh, it's a brilliant effect, but it's slightly not about that anymore. It's, you know what I mean? So both, both things get slightly corrupted and, and weakened. Um, so I'd much rather do really strong magic mm. uh, and then use that as a platform to then give my testimony. And the way I link it, it's basically I've always uh, linked the magic with the message of just talking about how um, just because something doesn't seem possible doesn't mean it can't happen. And just talking about that thing of not understanding something and something being beyond our understanding, which is what conjuring and magic tricks are. Yeah. Um, so, so that's always been my approach, is just to be much more general. And then just use it as a bridge, really, use it as a platform where I've, I've almost deserved the right to then talk to them. Which uh, is like, the same argument that Andre Cole used and Toby Travis and other folk in the States as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, to Toby was another one. When I, you know, I remember seeing Toby when he came across early days when I was early involved in the Fellowship of Christian Magicians. And I remember just seeing him, you know, it was him that I first saw did the tossed out deck and started me doing that. <laughs> uh, and he was just doing really strong magic and then and then talking about, you know, doing a faith message at the end. And that, that, for me, I think that's the most powerful way of doing it. I think gospel magic has its place, but if I'm honest, I, I tend to think, it, you know, it, it suits a children's audience more than an adult audience, really. Mm. Because I think children can sometimes use visual things. I think when we get to adults, quite often it can be a little bit of an insult to our intelligence that we have to use a trick to describe a simple concept to them. I guess when I first met you within the Fellowship of Christian Magicians, Pete McCann was still alive. Yeah. And yeah. he pretty much came out of the same stable as yourself, I think, in his thinking around evangelism and outreach. He did, yeah. I mean, Pete used to have a couple of things, uh, which, uh, to be honest, he had a quite nice, he did sort of a, I can't remember the exact workings of the trick, but it was like a gold block off a rope thing where he, he talked about, he did a, a chat about Star Trek and um, and breaking free of the sort of, um, of sin, you know, and it was, uh, and that was quite good. It felt quite modern. It was a, it was a modernish trick and his, his, his sort of spiel work, but uh, a lot of the time, you know, he, he did the same as what I do, I suppose. And, you know, um, we were we were both doing it separately before we actually met and realised we were doing a similar sort of thing, I suppose. Yeah. And when you lecture on comedy, magic, yeah. uh, you talk a little bit around, you have some rules that you apply. So if it's not funny, if it's not relevant, and I've forgotten the third one, I'm sorry. Yeah, fire. If you remember the word fire... Then, then that really helps. Um, so you want it to be on fire. So it, it's got to be funny, interesting, relevant, or entertaining. So, um, so whenever you're working on a routine, if anything that you're saying doesn't fit one of those four categories, I would say get rid of it. And a lot of people talk about, you know, you should have a, you know, you should have a director. Mm. And I think a director is a great idea, but also an editor is a great idea. And you can edit yourself. You just video yourself, and you'll see yourself saying things that are not. You know, just things like, okay, what I'm going to do now is take the cards out of the box. Well, that's not funny. It's not really relevant, you know. Mm. Just take them out of the box. You don't have to tell them. Uh, it's certainly not interesting, uh, and it's not entertaining. Now, if you can make that statement funny, relevant, interesting, or entertaining, then then keep it in. So, so when I do um, a lot of my routines, there are things that I have to do mm. that are part of the process of the trick. Yeah. So for the tossed out deck routine, for example, I need to explain, uh, you know, that the people need to leave the elastic bands on. Mm. I, I need to explain that they need to look in a specific corner when the prize them open. But at each of those things, I've made it either funny, interesting, or relevant entertaining. So when I say leave the elastic bands on, uh, you know, I say um, when you look at the card, leave the elastic bands on. It makes it much easier when you throw them to the next person. Mm. Then it, it, you know, you're sort of making that that statement that you want to say relevant. Um, and I ask them, you know, I want them to throw underarm, not overarm, because I, I don't want the cards thrown really hard and somebody to get hurt by the cards. So I say, when you throw the cards, you throw underarm, not overarm, because we have got a few older people here who could quite easily lose teeth or wigs or something. And then I look at a guy and say, well, not yours, obviously, so you've lost them. But, yeah. but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm realising that something's got to be said, um, because with magic, some things have to be said to make the trick understandable. 
But if they have to be said, make them funny, interesting, relevant, or entertaining. Um, and sometimes they're just relevant, and that's enough. You know, they're relevant, but sometimes they're not even relevant. You know, mm. I'm taking the cards out of the box. It's not relevant. You can right. just do that. They'll see you doing it. So, so I use that a lot um, as a little sort of uh, way of honing my routines down so that they feel very solid and they don't feel like there's any fat on the, on the bone, so to speak. And do you script your acts, John? Uh, not um, uh, I, I script it in my head but I don't, I don't script it and write it down sometimes I will write things down to help me remember points but normally I, I, a, a routine takes me quite a long time to develop so it might take a year before it's at a point where I think it's finished but, but it, it, it gets worked in through performance so when I start a routine there'll be lots of stuff that isn't funny, relevant, interesting or entertaining um, and I will, when I'm saying something, I'll be aware of trying to make everything one of those things. And slowly it will evolve. But I basically tend to, if I do an ad lib and it gets a laugh, when I'm performing it the next night, I will remember what I did the night before. That line will go in again until eventually um, it's part of the routine. So, so a routine does get written, but it tends to get written in my head, really, okay. uh, rather than written down. Not necessarily gospel magicians. What advice would you give, John, to gospel magic at the moment? I, um, to gospel magic, I would say um, it, just try and, you know, try and, you know, if you're going to do gospel magic, try and make it relevant today. So try and make it relevant to modern uh, magic that's happening today. Because if people come to see you and, you know, and you don't look like, you know, Darren Brown, Dynamo, um, even Paul Daniels is, you know, if you look like Paul Daniels, you get a little bit dirty now. But if if you're not looking like these, you know, modern people are seeing, you don't you don't have to be as dark as they are, obviously. But um, then then you're gonna be, you're gonna be seen as uh, second rate, really. And, and there's lots. Uh, and the other thing I, w- I would suggest to performers is, I think it's really healthy to perform in non uh, Christian venues and to non religious audiences. I think. Um, Christian audiences can be very, very generous and warm, and you know, if you're not very good, they can be very, very polite, and you can you can actually develop thinking that you've got a great act, and actually you've just got an act that people you know will put up with and are polite with. So I would say it's really healthy to try and perform um, to non-Christian audiences, which is why I like having a foot in both camps, really, because um, I think it keeps me fresh and relevant doing non-Christian stuff. In fact, Christians might be quite surprised, gospel magicians, if they go and perform a non-Christian audience, then sometimes you find that non-Christian audiences are actually nicer to perform for. They won't be as polite afterwards, but um, sometimes they're, they're, they're a joy to perform to just because they haven't got hang-ups about you know, what they laugh at or where, you know, whether they're in church and whether they're allowed to laugh at certain things. So sometimes performing for... I'm not saying you change your act. You still can perform the same clean act that you perform for churches. But but you will find that um, sometimes a non-Christian audience are, are a little bit more chilled out, um, and and so that's a you know that's a, uh, a, a sort of nice experience to have. Uh, but performing performing for both audiences certainly um, I think keeps you grounded, and and each one helps the other. I think. Excellent. Thank you for that, John. And finally, you you taught me a rule. Um, which I haven't really stuck to, in all honesty, but I try to, <laughs> which was never buy a trick until you've worked out the routine. Yeah, yeah I must admit, I don't. I stick to that most of the time, mainly because I, I, I'm aware of how much rubbish I've bought and never done. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, 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 now I just think I'll see a trick, and unless I know how I'm going to do it, and hopefully that it's going to be different to what anybody else is doing, then I tend not to buy it, and uh, you know I've got a couple of things that I'm, you know, I've been thinking about for uh, a year or two about whether to buy, and I still haven't got a, a routine in my head, so I won't buy them until I know how I'm going to do it. Um, Very wise. Yep. Also, originality is important. I, I think when you start out, everybody copies. When you, when, you know, when everybody, when you start out, everybody does the same thing. So we all, you know, we all do the same routines to the same pattern, or we, you know, we all do. Depend on who we are. I started out doing lots of Tommy Cooper jokes and hmm. um, you know and Paul Daniels routines, and I think that's all right when you're starting out. But you have to get to a point where you start doing stuff that is your 
your way of doing things. I think that's another reason why sometimes um, I get booked um, over other people is because I'm doing routines that are original to me. Mm. Um, so when they see me, they're not going to think, oh, well, we've seen somebody else do this. And, and we might think that, you know, that the brainwave deck uh, is a fantastic trick, and it is a fantastic trick. But the amount of magicians who are doing the brainwave deck is just hundreds and hundreds. And unless you can, you know, tossed out deck is the same, lots of people are doing tossed out deck. But, you know, I do it with all my own lines and all my own routines and, and my own gags, so it feels fresh and different. And I think we, we should always be trying to have material that is uh, original to us because you want people who, you know, when people book me, they're not, look, they, they don't say, we found out that you're a gospel magician um, or a Christian magician mm. and we'd like to book you. When people book me, they go, is that John Archer? We've heard things about you, or we've, heard, you know, you were recommended to us. So people, people are always coming to me because they want John Archer. And I never ever get inquiries to, from people who don't know who I am and just wonder whether I'll be any good for their event. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, they're booking me because um, they've either seen me and they like what I do, or somebody's recommended me to them, and they're booking me because um, of who I am rather than what I do. And I think that's important. Uh, and you, you'll only get that if you become you know, original to yourself. And for people starting out, what would you say to them? I think starting out, I think do anything. You know, starting out, don't worry too much about anything that I've said. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think starting out, you know, do tricks that you can do. Um, you know, if you need to do tricks using, you know, routines that you've bought and seen, you know, you've maybe, if you've got a DVD in mind, do one of my routines, you know, you've bought the DVD, you can do it. Um, and get as much experience as you can. Perform as much as you can. Don't worry about money when you start. Off. Don't worry about how much you're going to get paid. Mm. You know, do free gigs wherever you can, as much as you can. And when you start feel feeling like um, you feel competent and you, you, you're um, you're getting you know good reactions, then start trying to get original, and then start thinking about you know, the other sides of the business, like finance and stuff like that. And, and don't go full-time too soon. If you don't need, you know, if you don't need to go full-time, then don't go full-time. I went full-time uh, for, for a couple of reasons, but I was getting busy enough that I thought I could do it. And also I was fortunate enough that I was medically retired from my job, so I got mm. a pension that helped a little bit. Um, but there's no shame in doing it as a, you know, as a second job um, until it gets to the point where you're having success with it. Excellent. John, thank you ever so much for taking the time out. It's been a pleasure You're talking welcome. to you. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Good to talk to you as well, and I can't wait to see it all finished.